Hi, I'm Zivy Owens, and I am the host of this podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I am also a newly minted USA Today bestselling author of the novel, Blank. I've created a whole community of book lovers around this podcast, a publishing company, reading retreats, a bookstore, and more. Learn more at zivymedia.com or follow me on social at Zivy Owens or join the community at Zivy Readers. Griffin Dunn is the author of The Friday Afternoon Club, a family memoir. Griffin has been an actor, producer, and director since the late 1970s. Among his work, he produced and acted in After Hours. He directed Practical Magic and the documentary The Center Will Not Hold about his aunt, Joan Didion. Griffin and his dog, Mary, live in the East Village of Manhattan. Welcome, Griffin. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss The Friday Afternoon Club, a family memoir. It was so good. Oh my gosh. I like ate it all up. Every word. So good. I'm so glad. I like your dog in the background there. I know. I was just looking. I was like, oh my gosh, I should probably wake her up. But There's um, mine right there. Oh, so cute. <laughs> also asleep. Yeah. Usually she's on the couch, but you never know. <laughs> okay. Tell listeners about the book. When did you decide to write this? I know you started off always knowing it would be a family memoir, but yeah. when did you decide now's the time to write this book? And how did you get going? Well, I have a very intrepid agent. He wasn't really, I wasn't really a client of his, but we're friends. And he'd been after me to write a book uh, for at least 10 years because he'd heard my stories that I regaled about, about my own mishaps in New York and, and growing up in LA and, and also about my family who had a pretty scandalous and fascinating uh, past going back generations so along the way, without telling David Kuhn, the agent, I've been sort of logging stories and, and letting them sort of build until I felt sort of fecund and about, well, almost really less than two years. I wrote David and sent him uh, about uh, 40, 50 pages. And he went, oh, you sneaky, sneaky. <laughs> so this is great. I know how to sell this. And he drew up a beautiful proposal and and many publishers were interested and uh, as soon as uh, we worked everything out with penguin where you know i've been reading penguin books um they, they have so much uh, meaning in history to me that was a place i definitely wanted to be at i went right to work and i have to say it was it it just flowed i was just sort of obsessed i i came in well under my deadline i i found you know when i was acting in a movie when the camera would turn around and there'd be a setup, I'd rush back to my dressing room and and just pick up from where I left off. And it just sort of went like that for, uh, you know, a year and a half. Now you're making all other authors feel terrible. I know. I know it's always, it's not always going to be like that. Like, <laughs> you know, as a filmmaker, you know, people's, and it's true, I think sometimes with books, it just, it, 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 my first movie was just came so easily. And the sophomore effort, because you just know, there's so much expectation and and you're comparing yourself and you know what to be afraid of right. that the second work is usually more challenging. <laughs> well, that that, okay. I, I feel mildly better myself. I don't know. <laughs> One of the things that you do in the book is you, you make yourself into a character, right? You're, you show us how funny you can be and all these times where you're, you're the dark humor and wit and all of that. And, all the situations into which you <laughs> into which you fall that make you feel like you're in a, a movie to begin with. Can I just read this this passage towards the end? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. This is when you <laughs> you've gone to con and you don't, you're the dry cleaner still has your tuxedo and so you have to get the tuxedo from your security guard, which is so funny. You said I paced my room in just a bow tie and a shirt, taking no delight in the irony that Paul Hackett's misadventures continued to follow me even after I'd made the movie. These you're never going to believe what just happened moments have taunted me all my life. It's why Amy thought of me for the role and Marty couldn't imagine anyone else after picking up on my chaotic vibes. Marty being Martin Scorsese, just for those who aren't familiar on a first name basis, but that's okay. But it can be tiresome to constantly be in stressful situations that an unseen audience finds hilarious. 
If, when putting my room service tray in the hallway and only my underwear, the door locks behind me, I swear I can hear a laugh track. The $20 that blew out the window of the taxi at the beginning of the movie is something that actually happened to me in the back of a Chicago cab. I had hoped making after hours might exercise these laugh track moments of my life, but to date, no such luck. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they, they continue? Is that really the thing? I'm afraid they do. I'm afraid they do. Just, you know, remarkable. I, I have a very... Uh, a uh, hostile relationship with keys uh, <laughs> to this day, constantly losing them and being locked. And, and and I do find, you know, particularly when you're in a hurry, some very creative obstacles uh, come my way that I do think, oh, this doesn't happen to anyone else. This is only happening to me. <laughs> sure other people feel that, but it's certainly a way I, I continue to feel. I, I literally just ordered these tiles, I guess, where you can put them on your phone and your glasses and like things that you just stop. I just stop losing things all the time because you waste so much time oh, trying to find all these things. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll I, I am. I I lost the tiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh my gosh! So your book is really divided into two sections, and the first is almost a career memoir. It's a career and family story of how you're. Well, more family than career, but how, like, you're coming of age, so to speak, and how that goes with your whole family and the, you know, the issues within the members of the family and your own, you know, relationships. And then the second part is much more of the trial. And I'm so sorry for the loss of Dominique. I'm so sorry. That's so horrific. And you wrote about it with beauty and grace and and all of that. But anyway, so when you were structuring the memoir and trying to figure out the two things to tell, did you feel this pull of how to divide it and how to tell that story and how to make sure that the trial story didn't sort of take over the rest of the book? That was always a concern of mine because it was... Uh... I decided to write it chronologically, which sounds like a logical thing to do, but I'd originally envisioned the move, the book, uh, even when I was on my proposal, that it would be uh, a family memoir with chapters, with, with, with incidents that would take place. And I was inspired by David Sedaris's uh, uh, books about his family. Mm-hmm. And uh, my editor, John Burnham Schwartz, who's also a wonderful novelist as well, he suggested the boring tact of why don't you just write it in sequence and i realized the story doesn't begin with you know i was born in a manger Mm -hmm. the story began in the mexican revolution with pancho villa driving my mother's side of the family across the border to nogales and the great famine irish famine on my father's side and it brought me through their child my parents childhood and the difficulties that they had my father was had a very, very uh, abusive father, and and I just carried their lives along until I was born. And as I'm going along in sequence, I knew that the trial, that the murder and the trial, was on my path, and mm-hmm. I would I, I was kind of like dreading that part. Mm-hmm. But it just you know it arrived that sequence of events. And I, after I, I'd, I'd worked my way through that, it was very, I just, I, I wanted to, the trial in particular, I, I wanted to get across one travesty, judicial travesty after another that happened to us in the courtroom uh, without, without commentary, without me having to express my feelings. Cause the, by then the, the people would know the narrator, the readers would know the narrator well enough to know how I feel and that they would be as outraged. As, as we were, and is confounded. And so when I got through that part, and then I continued with my career, I realized this is a, this is book two. Mm. And, it, and it totally, and so I went back and I just put book two, which was the beginning of the trial. Hmm. And then I took a chapter that I'd written chronologically of, of the homicide detective, Johnston, uh, Harold Johnston waking my mother up to tell her that Dominique, my sister, her her daughter, was uh, had been strangled. It was on life support, and I made that the prologue. Yep. And and then I knew, I knew what my ending was going to be. That I was going to open with death, and end with life, with my daughter being born. So the structure came to me by writing chronologically. Hmm. Wow, that's really interesting. 
You wrote one of the most powerful scenes, I think, was when your brother Alex was institutionalized or these two other people had brought him and you were the one who had to sign him in to stay. And you were like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And you took him out. And you could tell you were just like racked with guilt. You didn't want to leave him, but he was having another manic episode. In fact, the whole way you wrote about Alex and mental illness was really nuanced and beautiful and, and shows really clearly what it's like to live with somebody or li- to love somebody who well, yes. struggles. Tell me about that moment and and just the takeaways from this whole thing. And I'm so happy that at the end you said he's doing very well because I was yeah, really sure rooting is. for him all along. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, 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 he's doing great. And he, just backing up for a moment, you know, I, 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 when I wanted to write the book, I, I could not write it without my brother's blessing. Mm-hmm. And in order to write about my family, and uh, I would have to, you know, talk about his his uh, his mental struggles at that period in his life. And he said, "You can write whatever you want about me. Just have it come from a place of love." And it was a, a note that I took to heart with everyone um, who was in my immediate family. And beyond. And so Alex and I were very, very close, are very close. And, you know, having to, you know, see him, you know, locked up in this UCLA psychiatric ward was just torture for me to see him like that in that condition and him, you know, begging me to to get him out of there. And I, I just, I, I loved him too much. I didn't have the heart. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. It was, uh, and I said to the judge, in this little courtroom, you know, where you have someone mandatorily committed, I just broke down. I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I started to cry. And Alex was was free. He was not free of his illness. That would continue on for some some years. But that was a uh, that was a very tough, uh, tough time for both of us. Sorry. Did you ever read or see the recent series of I Know This Much Is True by Wally Lamb? I sure did. I sure did. And, you know, uh, Mark, Mark Ruffalo is a, a, a good friend of mine. Oh. And uh, I, <laughs> I get so emotional. I've opened up some vein ever since writing this book. But I, I had called him and he knew about my brother. And, you know, Mark has had a tragedy in his family with his brother. And we just talked and talked about that. It just really hit me deep. His, his performances as himself, as, you know, playing his brother and as well as the central figure I, they got it just right they got it just right that was i felt so i related to that I, I hadn't read the book but i the series really moved me yeah it was so powerful i always think about that it was just amazing especially in the context of yours but so you have these very you know heartfelt dark moments in your mother's you know ms and you know just so there's so much stuff in here and yet then we're like you know, hanging out with all these celebrities. Like, there's just so much. You're in this full ride, which is, of course, your life. Carrie Fisher, by the way, so my husband Kyle started Morning Moon Productions with Billy and her husband Austin. So they... Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. So I was, like, there looking at the house that they're rebuilding and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, I know that house. (laughs) You know, I've written Billy. I'm just encouraging her to read the book and... I, I don't know that she has yet. I think her uh, her dad might have. You know, sometimes, you know, when the book was about to come out or something, there, there'd be little tiny gossipy things that would just focus on something that Carrie and I even talked about on camera in her documentary about her, about me taking her virginity. And they make it sound so salacious, like that's what the book was about. So I remember I, I, I contacted uh, Billy and the father going, read the book. Read the book. <laughs> love the book. You're going to, it's going to bring back your mom. And that section was so much fun to write. And, you know, Charlie Wessler who's in the book and Carrie had a close knit of friends of myself, a guy named Gavin DeBecker and Bruce Wagner, the wonderful writer and uh, Beverly D'Angelo. And they'd read the book and they just were, that was the ultimate compliment. Like you got her. It was like being in the room with her, which thrilled me. Oh, it felt like I was in the room with her when I was writing it. It felt like we were too. <laughs> Sounded like a very fun room to be in, yeah, <laughs> although yeah, per- yeah. perhaps not near that shower, but with the hand or whatever. Uh, you wrote something so 
nice about her, too. You said, in the years ahead, I was there for her, her family weddings and she for many of mine. She loved to pretend she couldn't remember which of my exes was which. But of course she knew and dug for every little nugget about when and where it all went wrong with the same curiosity she'd had about my proclivities when she was a virgin. I wish I could remember our last conversation before she left for London on the trip from which she never came home in 2016. It was probably about Christmas plans or our daughter shenanigans, but I know, despite not remembering what exactly was said, that we laughed very, very hard. Hmm. So good. It chokes me up just to hear it. It's so good. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, this is, I'm sure, will be a gift to to Billy and the whole family. So it's yeah. really fun. <laughs> you also, which has gotten, I know, a lot of media attention, this sort of expose, if you will, of your dad and things that we might not have known about him as a public figure in his own right, in addition to your you know, aunt and uncle and, and all of that. How do you think your dad having, let's pretend he just read this book. What do you think he would say to you? I, I, I think about that a lot. And I, and I, I'm pretty certain I, I'm right about this answer that he would be really very, very proud. And, you know, both, both he and John and Joan did not hold back when writing about their uh, writing about themselves and their own personal journeys. And, you know, dad had said once, to me, we were having a conflict about something. He, and he would say, write it, write it down. Just let me have it. You're going to feel great. Just say whatever the hell you want about me. I don't care. Just get it down. And that rang in my ear. And so I think he, you know, he's very, he was very honest about himself. You know, he did a documentary. There was a documentary about him. And he talked about a lot of the same things I did about you know, his his sort of weaknesses as a as a social climber and how important it was to give parties and to be at parties and be invited to parties by celebrities and famous people. Uh, you know, he really worshipped at the altar of, of of fame. And, you know, as a as a as children and it kind of made my and my brother and I kind of uncomfortable. You know, Dominique was much younger and, you know, it was like kind of, um, you know, I talk about him. You know, when I was young, my my best friends were, their fathers were movie stars and played tough guys. One guy was Jack Palance, who who was the gunslinger in Shane. And the other was Howard Keel, who was a lumberjack. And, you know, my father was not particularly known for his masculinity and tough guy stuff. That came later, the real tough guy. Mm-hmm. Yes. But, but at that time, you know, they these my friends, Gunnar and Cody, would taunt me and go, my our dad could lick your dad with one hand tied behind their back, and I said, "Well, uh, he he wouldn't. He kick both your asses, and and he wills just as soon as he gets out of prison." <laughs> <laughs> and I made up this lie. What's he in for? I said he robbed a bank, and the rumor went around like smallpox. It was like the the principal called my dad, <laughs> and then my dad when he came home from work. Just went, is that something you want me to do, Griffin? Rob a bank? <laughs> so I was so embarrassed. And he was embarrassed. You know, it was like, you know, he kind of knew, he, he knew I, I wasn't, you know, proud of him as I came to be. But at that time, I was, you know, just a kid who had an idea of what a man was supposed to be. And and at that time, I thought my father didn't fit the bill. Uh, well, he certainly, and that was before I knew, I never knew he was a war hero. You know, and later in life, you know, when he was very well known and and received all these awards and was recognized on the street, he'd always tell you. And, you know, quite proudly, he really enjoyed his late life uh, success. But he never told me about that. He never bragged. He never told me he saved two soldiers' lives in the Battle of Mintz toward the end of the war. And so, you know, there was... As I say in the book, you know, I, I, I wanted to be, uh, you know, I always had this idea of what it was to be a man, and and didn't realize till much later I've been raised by one all along. Mm, I love that. So, what is success? What does the success of this book mean to you? Like, what would you deem successful? What would have? To, what would happen? Well, what do you want to happen? I guess. Well, the first success was finishing it actually doing it. It was, it was on my bucket list to someday write a book. I, 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 I'm a big reader and I've been, you know, taking in the styles of different writers and 
you know, seeing how, you know, Philip Roth and writers that I admire, how they do it. I've been doing that even subconsciously for a long time. But I think that the success and the the the, the praise and I just love hearing how much I, I, I'm at an enjoyed break uh, at an age where I can just take in all the love and not <laughs> be conflicted about it as, you know, people are when they're younger and they're get success very early, but it, it's different than, you know, coming out in a movie that I directed or was in or produced because this, I did, this is the only thing I've ever done all by myself. It's, it's been a solo flight all the way along and the landing has been triumphant. I feel like Lindbergh or something, you know? <laughs> and, and so I have that, uh, I have a, a real sense of accomplishment of, of having done something by myself and, and starting and finishing it and then having it and being proud of the end result. Well, you should be. It's really good. And the way you tell stories is captivating and um, the pacing is so good. And it's a nice clean writing style where you're totally in it. And, um, you know, as a book itself, I think it is, it is great. And obviously you had all the stories to fill it. You know, it's like a that's going to sound terrible. I was like envisioning it like a build a bear. I'm obviously spending too much time with my children, but you know, like <laughs> like the outside is great, but like it's the you know the stuffing. Anyway, whatever. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Well, I'm a novice writer myself, but I will give advice anyway. That not to censor yourself. Just just keep writing. Just just get it down. Just plow forward. The fun part is editing, but just get it get it all out. Uh, you know, I'd be. I would turn in pages to to my editor, John, 50, you know, lumps of 50 or 60 pages. And, you know, some was just, you go, come on, you don't want to say that. Or, or you know, just go, I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about here. And I go, okay, that's a good note. And then I would just go back and fine tune it and fine tune it. And I I, I just, I just didn't censor myself. I, 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 one piece of great advice I learned from Joan not that she told me, I, I read it, but I took it to heart, was always leaving something, the end of the day, leaving something incomplete that you look forward to picking up the next morning. That was great advice. And I would go to bed having to resist the urge to get out of bed you know, in the middle of the night and keep keep on going, which sometimes I failed at that. But, but that was good advice that I got from her that I'll pass along. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for the book, for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Zip. I feel like you, you need to go start like a sub stack or something because now I need to read. I want to keep following. You know, like now I feel very invested. I'm like, okay, <laughs> now what? Like, how's it going? What? Where are the uh, stories? I got more. I got more. Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for including me in your, with your summer read. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, this was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Take care. Congrats. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you love it, please leave a review and follow us on social at Zibby Owens and at Zibby Readers. 